Shea Patterson goes to Michigan. I I didn't know whether that was a good fit or not, uh, especially wherever he went. I wasn't sure he's going to be eligible. But even beside from that, now that he is declared eligible, uh, why Michigan? I'll tell you, the thing about Shea Patterson watching him coach, uh, this guy's athletic. And I think um, I think Jim Harbaugh is going to be a good enough coach. you got to adjust to him. You know, it's, it's Sometimes I see coaches be so hard-headed to say, this is my system and you got to fit it. Well, the thing about Shea Patterson is he gives you that little, to me, that 12th man effect. And what I mean by that is he can move. And when you can move and throw – it's a tremendous advantage. It's, you know, it's that point guard uh, that knows how to distribute the ball. Uh, he can extend the play. He can improvise. And I think when you put him in gun and you let him do some RPOs, this, you know, the read zone thing, read zone, read zone, now read zone pass, um, I, I think he's dangerous. And um, Michigan has a lot of tradition. You know, I don't know the family. I don't know if there was any ties. I don't know that. Uh, I do know that he had a good lawyer. I know that. And um, it, it's good for him. He gets to play and uh, gets to play immediately. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered about that. Barry? Uh, Houston, we got a little controversy over here between Tua and Jalen. <laughs> Jalen's dad uh, did a little article with a guy. And, you know, I think he was just shooting from the hip. Some of the stuff the guy put in the article, I. Uh, hear from sources uh, was kind of off the record, kind of a guy just talking. But it, And he said, hey, Jalen screwed up. He opened the door. He let the kid get on the field, and now he he, he dug his bed or made his bed. Now he's going to dig himself out of it. Uh, I guess it's a good problem to have, but it seems like this one's getting more publicity than anything. And I know Coach, Sa- Coach Saban's going to handle it on his own terms. Have you ever gone through a quarterback uh, situation like this, uh, Houston? If so, how do you handle it? Yeah. yeah, I've been through a couple of similar, you know, and the thing about quarterback, not like a linebacker receiver, they all want to play. Where receivers and linebackers and running backs, you can rotate them and everybody gets theirs. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit easier, but, as far as quarterback, uh, you know, Jalen Hurts won, has won a lot of football games. And, um, you know, the good thing for him, he's gotten a lot of reps this spring. He can get better. Uh, and there's nothing like competition. And you find out what somebody's uh, uh, really about when, when you know you have somebody that has come in and won a national championship. And so tremendous competition. It, it is good. But uh, it also, you know, has to be handled right because – the thing about a quarterback is, you know, they'll pack their bags and they'll, they'll leave because they want to go play. And um, th- this will be interesting. See, and you, you are going to have a lot of publicity on this thing because all eyes will be on the quarterbacks and who's going to play, who's going to play. But uh, I'll be surprised if Jalen Hurts doesn't start. And uh, the you. reason I say Thank that you. is because uh, he's going to, you know, he's won a lot of football games, guys. He's won a lot of football games, and uh, I think he'll only get better in a passing game. But, uh, boy, I tell you, the lefty, too, he is um, some kind of talent, no question. But why do you, why do you say that? You would be just because Jalen's won, so won so many games. Uh, you know, people hear what they saw what Tua did. Of course, it's just one half. He hadn't been scouted. Uh, w- what makes you say you think uh, Jalen will be the starter? I agree with you, Houston. I agree with you. <laughs> I hear you, Coach. I just, I just believe this, Barry. Uh, you know, he did come in for a half. He's played one half. And, I mean, it was a great half. And he's going to be remembered and go down in history and all that. But I, I just think it's something, too, when a quarterback has been there uh, and has won so many games, won championships, and uh, he's taken the majority of the spring, right, from what I've read. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so now, Tua, you, right. you, you talk to Tua, like, Tua, you come in here. And uh, during two days, roll up your sleeves and go to work. Uh, there's a place for you on this football team right now. Jalen Hurts is number one. I, I see it exactly the same way. I think that's coaching. Uh, he's right. got he's got to take his job, and I don't think he took his that's job, right. even though he won a national championship. I'm not sure that he did. We've got a new we've got a change at Tennessee, and I, I think. Um, uh, it's a good change for Tennessee, and a lot of things have been said by the coach and 
he, he's taking the same approach that Coach Saban took. Uh, nobody talks but him. And it's a disappointing yeah. bunch of guys who wallered around. And you've got an athletic director who came in and said, uh, we're going to find out why those guys wallered around, which I don't think it was his business. And we're going to find out why we had guys on that didn't have enough talent to play to start with, which I don't think was his business. Um, you want your athletic director for you because he hired you, but he do- I don't want my athletic director making comments for me. Is that right or wrong? Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing about this is the relationship. You know your athletic director has been there. You know he's been a coach, so there's a respect there. I had a, uh, the privilege to, to work for Frank Broyles. And one of the things I did is I always went to his office first uh, because I've always heard uh, in the previous times, uh, you know, he's a meddler. He's a meddler. He's a meddler. Well, I Good played point. for Coach Broyles, so I wanted to hit that first. So I went to his office before he came to my office. And so every off day I went to him and said, Coach, give it to me. What do you think? And got his ideas. And not that I would use every one of his ideas, but there is knowledge there. But the bottom line is, you know, Jeremy Pruitt's the head football coach. Everything, uh, a, a, you're the one that's got to make the final decision on the football field. And it, it, the bottom line is winning. We all know that. We can talk about community service. We can talk about graduation rates. But the bottom line is, they pay you to win. And so every situation, whether it be what socks we're wearing, how many sprints we're going to run, all these things falls on the head coach. It's your job. Let's get it done. There's nothing wrong with listening to a man that has a lot of knowledge, who's won a national title, and uh, he's going he's gonna to be there. He's going to have a lot of influence and all that. But the bottom line is close that door with your staff after you've talked to the AD and go to work, make good decisions, and take that team where they can't go by themselves. Yeah, I think the difference is, though, you go to the office and pretty much uh, until you tell it on the radio, nobody knows that. Uh, in in Tennessee's factor, it was public. Uh, it was more yeah. public as to what uh, what happened. I think there's a, quite a bit of difference in you going to the office. And, and yeah. um, you know, I listen from, to a lot of guys myself. And uh, I think that was a little bit different. Yeah. I can see that, Coach. Uh, yeah. Houston, Fair. not that Alabama need any more advantages in recruiting, uh, but when the NFL draft <laughs> comes up and you have four guys going the first round, 12 drafted uh, in the first seven rounds, uh, that's got to be a tremendous, tremendous advantage. Not that they needed one, not that they weren't recruiting great, but, uh, boy, that really speaks highly of your program. And not only do you recruit well, but you develop. And these NFL guys uh, really like the Alabama players. Just talk about what a draft like that does for the program. Well, I think it says it all, Barry. I think it says it all when uh, you you have that many guys that are taken. You're you, you're getting you know it's one thing to have okay you're rated the number one recruiting class. I don't know how many years it's been, but to me the the, the sure telltale sign is when the next level the highest level says we want your players and we want your players because we know how they're developed. We know how they're trained and um, we want them now in our locker room. And so I think that's the highest reward as a coach. uh, One of the highest rewards, because all that does is uh, it helps recruiting for the, for the next one. It's motivation for the next group. And when high school seniors come out and say, Ooh, Alabama had 12, <laughs> had 12. Well, that's my dream, too. I'm 18 years old, and I'm, I want to I be at that level. And so I want to go somewhere where somebody's going to teach me and help me get there. And so I think all those things are just so, so positive. I think it's also something after the first round when you see just one player come from the Big 12. Um, you know, after playing in the Big 8, uh, I played in the Big 8. <clears throat> I used to think it was one of the best conferences, you know, in the, in the, in the country. Um, it's different now. It's different when you just have, to me, one player taken for the Big 12. Yeah, how frustrating is it, too? Like, I hear Minkus Fitzpatrick, when he went to his interviews, he put on a coat and tie, and he said, Coach Saban and their program, that they kind of teach us how to interview all the different things. Then you got Darius Geis from LSU that goes to these NFL meetings. He said he wanted to play video games more than he wanted to be at the meetings. He acted like he didn't want to be there. 
Uh, does that reflect poorly on LSU and, and getting a kid ready, or is that do you just put that on the kid? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. You know, when you look at uh, Coach Saban and, and Minka has a coat and tie on, I know there's influence, and and I and I know that Coach Saban has said, "Hey, you're going for a for an interview. Your 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 name." Everything that you do, when you walk in that room, immediately the eyes are on you, and you're going to get questions from A to Z. This is a interview for for your next, you know, the, the next chapter in your life. And so let's represent. And so, to me, just look at let's look at a young man coming in with a coat and tie, focused eyes, sitting up in a chair, right, with a guy coming in and slouching or walking in and. You know, not dressed properly and more, con- more wanting to get to the to the room where you can play videos. You know, it, it's gonna it's gonna say a lot. And um, again, I wasn't there. I don't know, but just just hearing and listening uh, to me, that's the influence of uh, Coach Saban and uh, really trying to help these guys, advise these guys to do it the right way. Yeah. I, uh... I had a stat here I wanted to, to get you because I think you were a two-sport athlete as well. Uh, a guy put out, said 29 of the 32 first-round draft picks were two-sport athletes, and 14 of those 29 were three-sport athletes. He said the next time your personal trainer or your coach tells you you need to specialize in football or any other sport, maybe you need a new trainer or coach. Uh, Houston, <laughs> were you big on that, uh, recruiting guys that played multiple sports? I was. I was, and, and the rule was this: it, you must you must contribute. Uh, when you go play, if you're gonna if we're gonna put you on scholarship for football, and most of my guys were football slash track, and I said if you're gonna run track for Coach McDonald, you got to contribute. You just can't go down there and, and get away from football. You got to go down and contribute, and you also got to keep up your schoolwork. You got to keep your grades up, and uh, it was big. I had a couple of guys play basketball. That's harder. I did that in college, and it's not easy, and it takes a real strong commitment, you know, academically to do that because you travel so much in basketball. But there's something about two-sport athletes. You know, I love guys, some of the best linemen that I ever signed, you know, uh, Jason Peters and Sean Andrews and all these guys, they play basketball. And you could tell these big linemen uh, that were involved in AAU ball, uh, they were getting up and down the court and you could just visualize what they could do in the trenches because mm-hmm. of the quickness and the athleticism. And so we really looked at that hard. And then I, I love two-sport athletes as long as they have, uh, they're doing it for the right reasons and they want to contribute and keep up their schoolwork. Yep. You know, it, it, as we, we'll let you go. But um, to me, it's absolutely amazing for M- Baker Mayfield to yeah. leave Texas Tech um, I, they didn't see anything in him, and that happens sometimes. I, I, I lost kids that I didn't see anything in, I guess. Uh, and then go and and work and get a scholarship and win the Heisman Trophy and then be number one, whether that's right or right, right, right or wrong for Cleveland. But isn't that a, a sort of an amazing story regardless? <laughs> Coach, it, it really is. It's, it's one of the greatest stories ever when you really sit and think about that this guy – was a walk-on, and I, I'm a little partial just watching this guy. He won the Burroughs work. You know, one of our former players at Arkansas that was killed in a tragic accident, he won the Burroughs work. The Burroughs work trophy is for the best player that started as a walk-on, like Brandon Burroughs work did. And so I followed this guy, and uh, Baker Mayfield, it's just a, an unbelievable story. And uh, we're all he's, he's been, we're, what he's gone through, and to be the first player taken, uh, it, it, it's really remarkable. And you just love this guy's competitive spirit, and you hope that uh, he, you know, he manages all of it and takes it on to the next level. And uh, and and I tell you, if this offense gets right, and again, I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, guys. I think you got to adjust a little bit now. You got to adjust to Baker Mayfield. I don't think he's the. Don't you can't be putting him up underneath the center and uh, making him the, the old-fashioned uh, NFL-style quarterback. That's not him. Uh, this guy is a uh, true gunslinger in the shotgun, and I tell you, his teammates, I, I think they 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 kind of gravitate to this guy. He, you know, he's a magnet, and he has this this little 
this attitude of, hey, follow me. When it's third and eight, I'm going to get nine. So follow me. So well, it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. How hard is that, though, yep. used it for a, for a rookie to walk into an NFL locker room with grown men. These guys are fathers. It's a, they've been doing this job for a while and take over. Because a quarterback, I don't want to take over the locker room is the way to say it, but how, how hard is that for him to go in there? Because uh, they're going to look at him like, you better prove yourself first. Uh, how, how difficult is that for a guy like Baker Mayfield going in? I, tell you, I don't think it'll be that difficult in this situation because of this, Barry. Yeah. Cleveland Browns only 16. <laughs> True. They're only 16, and they're looking for somebody. They want him to be a winner. They want him to be the captain. So I think with his moxie and his attitude, if he'll come to work and study what they give him and no nonsense and come to work with practice, he'll win that locker room over. I, 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 think he, I, I really think he will. But the timing of, of everything, when you hadn't had success and you're the first player taken, hey, it, to me, it's a it's a tremendous situation. Things are laid out right for you. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a lot different, I guess, walking in that locker room and walking into the New England Patriots locker room. Yeah, you go, that, there you go. <laughs> no, no question. Because, you know, you got Tom Brady. He's, one, he's got about, I don't know how many championships rings, and he'll say, hey, hey, not so fast, young man. Yeah. Just get in get in line. I'm going to help you learn, uh, teach you how to be a professional. And uh, I think he still has to do some of that with respect to the older guys. I get all that. But in this scenario, be yourself, you know, take everything in stride, learn that playbook, and hit the field with nothing but energy and attitude, that moxie that he has, and, and try to help a team that hadn't won. Yeah, I think you're right. It's depending on which locker room you're walking in uh, as to how you can act. So, Houston, great stuff as always. We appreciate you being on with us. All right, guys. Y'all keep it going. Thank you. I'll see you.